Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University. We welcome you to another in our continuing series of roundtable discussions on the scriptures of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This session we have the unparalleled opportunity to continue to discuss the Doctrine and Covenants, a marvelous collection of revelations, mostly given through the Prophet Joseph Smith. Joining me today for our discussion are members of the Department of Church History and Doctrine. Directly across the table from me, Professor Matt Richardson, Professor of Church History and Doctrine. Thanks for joining us, Matt. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Nice to have you here. Professor Randy Bott, also Professor of Church History and Doctrine. Thanks for joining us, Randy. Professor Alex Baugh, also of the Department of Church History and Doctrine. It's good to have you with us, Alex. Thank you. Enjoy, enjoy this opportunity. Good. And I'm Andrew Skinner, Dean of Religious Education at Brigham Young University. Well, brethren, this is a wonderful chance to jump into one of the great sections of the Doctrine and Covenants. Section 27 is where we're going to begin today, and uh, lots and lots of doctrine to talk about. But before we uh, start talking about the doctrine, it might be helpful if we gave our uh, viewers sort of a historical setting or the historical context out of which Section 27 came. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what's going on in the church in uh, August of 1830 and also what is it that precipitates Section 27 of the Doctrine and Covenants? Any ideas? Well, uh, Section uh, 27 really uh, comes as a result of the fact that Emma had not yet received the uh, sacrament. Uh, in June of 1830, June 28th, actually, she had been baptized, and during the course of the baptism, uh, the baptism was interrupted and Joseph Smith was arrested. And uh, the ordinance of, uh, of uh, receiving the sacrament was never uh, performed, or, or the ordinance of receiving um, the confirmation and the sacrament, of course, was not re received. So uh, Joseph uh, uh, has, uh, it's, what, it's two months now. And uh, uh, as it turns out, a man by the name of Newell Knight from Colesville uh -huh. is, um, uh, he has a wife named Sally. Sally um, also has not been uh, received the ordinance of confirmation. And uh, Newell comes down with his wife, uh, asks Joseph to perform that ordinance, uh, which he does and would, uh, would do for her. And as things turned out, uh, he decides to confirm Emma as well. In the process of doing that and going to get wine for the sacrament, uh, an angel appears and, uh, and tells him, of course, uh, the following verses 1 through 4. And uh, so that's kind of a little background there. Uh, that's, re that's really helpful. Yeah. Matt, isn't it interesting, as once again we see, as with all these sections of the Doctrine and Covenants, that the revelations come out of circumstances. Um, situations where the Lord is going to be teaching important doctrines and truth and they coincide or they fit so nicely with the experience of these real people with real questions, real circumstances, and hey, let's let's have the sacrament, and and then here is the segue where we have this wonderful information coming from well, the sacrament. It's just really neat. Well, we've been saying this all along in our roundtable discussions. I think if you look at the letters of the second half of the New Testament, for example, they come out of real life situations. There are problems that need to be taken care of. There are revelations that need to be received. That's a period of transition. It's a period of revelation. We're now in a period of transition. We're in a period of revelation. The kingdom is restored. The doctrines and the principles and the ordinance haven't been on the earth for, what, 1,800 years, exactly. and now they're being restored, and so they come out of these, these challenges. Randy, you were saying something to me a while ago about the significance of the Doctrine and Covenants. Well, the Doctrine and Covenants will really come to life, it did for me, and I, it has for many of my students, as they look at this being a, a, a real-life situation, a problem that, they're, that people are facing, 
the Lord is going to tutor them all the way from their spiritual infancy through step-by-step -step process until they're prepared to return to his presence. And so each section represents like a snapshot of solutions to problems like Matt has talked about that, uh, that the pe real life people like us face. And when we can take the uh, transition and make it from uh, the 1830s to 2000s, uh, then the value of the Doctrine and Covenants just, just beca becomes a phenomenal book. We're not so much different than Martin Harris in some ways, or from Joseph, or, for, or from Newell Knight in many ways. And when well, we maybe can you're see not that, different from well, Joseph, but times. I'm really different than, than Joseph, unfortunately. Uh, no, I think that that point is well taken. Let's talk a little bit about the magnificent doctrines that, uh, that are set forth in section 27. For me, section 27 breaks down nicely into uh, snippets of verses or, or sections of verses. You mentioned verses one through four as talking about what can be used for the emblems of the sacrament. Uh, also, there is uh, a, a really wonderful um, discussion of the Savior's atoning sacrifice in verse 3 as part of that of that larger uh, section. And then uh, verses 5 through 14 seems to me to constitute another section that we can talk about uh, this magnificent uh, sacramental service that will be instituted when the Savior comes again, the beginning of his millennial reign. And then verses 15 through 18, uh, talking about putting on the whole armor of God and the reasons why we're commanded uh, to put on the whole armor of God and what the metaphors stand for in our lives. So let's, if with your permission, let's uh, take a look at these different sections. Talk to us about verses one through four. What's the Lord say about what can be used for the emblems of the sacrament? You know, I think before you even jump in what can be used, there's an emphasis there that, that strikes the point of what can be used is to remember the purpose thereof. And so when we look at this notion of sacraments, sometimes it's always this principle of remembering past events, of remembering back to the, the sacrifice of the Savior, similar to a Passover experience, remembering a Passover time in the past, but, but it's remembering why, you know. And so you look at verse 2 is, is um, for behold, I say unto you that it mattereth not what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink when ye partake of the sacrament. Then here for me is the kicker, if, that there's the important part. If it so be that ye do it with the eye single to my glory, remembering unto the Father my body, which was laid down and my blood. It's, it's sometimes we focus on, well, what can we use for the sacrament? And we get into long lists. Well, can we use this? Can we use this? Can we use this? And the Lord's saying it doesn't make any difference as long as the foundation if. is in proper place. To me, this, I may have said verse 3 before, but I really meant verse 2. Verse 2 links the sacrament and the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ because it really is his blood the shedding of his blood that brings a remission of sins. This is what Paul said in the, in the book of Hebrews. Without the shedding of the blood of God, there is no remission of sins. Well, that's what we're talking about that's right. here. And, and that's the foundation. I, I appreciate that. another point that's really interesting to me on this is that uh, it's the Savior, the very object of our adoration and worship that says, I say unto you, you can use whatever. And that isn't the main point Good. of what you use. That, uh, and so people at times will criticize and they'll say, well, the Lord instituted uh, bread and wine and why do Mormons or Latter-day Saints use uh, water? And yet the Savior himself says, let's not focus on that, I say unto you. So that's a good point is the focus is, uh, let's refocus that's and make right. sure we are focused. That's, that's, the, that's the focus good. comes back to the Savior. He's in the limelight where he always should be. And, and, and I think we've been saying this all along in our, in our discussions. You, uh, President Benson was in war-torn Europe. Uh, I believe it was Poland, and they couldn't uh, find enough bread, so they used potato peelings. And certainly, again, the whole uh, emblem was focused on the Savior. And uh, if you think uh, about that, uh, that's all that really matters. Well, so. And again, I, I come back to this point that we've made before, and that's the marvelous nature of the Doctrine and Covenants. Here is a book of Scripture that is written in the first instance in our language, in the English language. It's not given to a prophet 2,000 years ago in a, in a foreign tongue, and it has to be translated and retranslated. This is the voice of the Lord Himself, as you were yeah. pointing out 
to us to the Lord's prophet in modern days in our language. So that, you know, it, no matter, no, no wonder it's, a, it's such a wonderful experience to read the Doctrine and Covenants because we're getting the Lord's words here straight from uh, his prophet. Um, anything else in verses 1 through 4? That you, uh, one of the things that strikes me, I always think of of, uh, of the Savior's atoning sacrifice in connection with what the Apostle Paul said in uh, in the book of Hebrews, where he says it's it's really by the blood of Christ that we're able to enter heaven, and it seems to me that that's kind of what the Savior is drawing our our attention to. And Paul also said something else that uh, when I read these words in verse two, remembering unto the Father my body. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Paul said the, the torn flesh of the Savior puts us back to his crucifixion and the torn veil of the temple. One symbolizes the other thing. We have a chance to remember that every week in the okay. sacrament. Okay. Verses 5 through 14. Talk to us about this. What's, what's the Savior pointing us to here? You know, for me, forever, I was always looking at the sacrament as looking back at the atonement that had been made, and yet it became apparent that there is yet another meeting that's going to be held to which some very illustrious characters are going to be invited, uh, of which we could be part of that if we will be true and faithful, that is yet future. Who, who are, well, Matt, start us off, read for us <laughs> verse 5, and, and remembering what uh, Randy has just said. Behold, this is wisdom in me. Wherefore, marvel not, for the hour cometh that I will drink of the fruit of the vine with you on the earth and with Moroni, whom I have sent unto you to reveal the Book of Mormon containing the fullness of my everlasting gospel, to whom I have committed the keys of the record of the stick of Ephraim. And then it goes on. Then you got that guest list that just goes boom, yeah. boom, 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 Elias boom, and John, boom. And we'll get to those in a minute. But I just want to focus on, on these words in verse 5. For the hour cometh that I will drink of the fruit of the vine. What's that hark back to? What's back, it take you back to? Yeah, back to the upper room. Exactly. Where I said I would not, uh, will not partake of the fruit of the vine on earth until I come again. Yeah. So. It, 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 this is verse 18 of, of Luke chapter 22. But we could, you know pick out the same general passage in the other synoptic gospels. Verse 18 of Luke 22, For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. So as you point out, here's the Savior in this very, very solemn setting, just hours before he undergoes or begins to uh, undergo the atonement in Gethsemane and then later on at Golgotha. And he's saying to them, this is not only the first time, but it is also pointing to another time in the future. He doesn't use the words 2,000 years hence, but we could insert those, where I'm going to drink or I'm going to participate in a sacramental service with you and with others. But for now, it's the time to remember the atoning sacrifice and also see the fulfillment of the Passover that you've been participating in for the last 1,200 years. And look what that does. It's, it's a wonderful linking of past, present, and future. And, and once again, it's the weaving together of all things are one eternal round. And, and uh, when you start the Doctrine and Covenants in the first section, it talks about that these will testify that the words of the prophets will be fulfilled. And, and so here you see this in marvelous tones of, I will come again in the future. And here's the reminder. Don't forget to look forward to something here. Don't just look back. Look forward to what's taking place. And that's a joyous experience to look forward to the notion of coming with the Savior. What type of a setting do you envision, Andy, of this being where, where all of these illustrious characters and the faithful are brought together in this sacrament meeting? Well, Randy, I assume that you ask me that because you know I have a quotation from Elder Bruce R. McConkie's book, The Millennial Messiah, in which he equates... Um, Adam on Di Almond as the place where this millennial sacrament meeting, this covenantal sacrament service will take place. Let me just read to you a couple of paragraphs which I find uh, tremendously significant. This is from, again, The Millennial Messiah by Elder Bruce R. McConkie. Quote, the worshipful nature of the final gatherings at Adam on Di Almond, and surely such will be patterned after what happened there anciently, the worshipful wonder of it all is seen in the administration of the sacramental emblems that will then take place. These are the emblems that testify of the spilt blood and broken flesh 
of our redeeming Lord. The sacrament is to be administered in a future day on this earth when the Lord Jesus is present and when all the righteous of all ages are present. This, of course, will be a part of the grand council at Adam on Diamon. Adam on Diamon, meaning the place or land of God where Adam dwelt, is at a place called Spring Hill, Davies County, Missouri. This site is named by the Lord Adam on Diamon because, as he said, it is the place where Adam shall come to visit his people, or the Ancient of Days shall sit, as spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Adam on Diamon, the land of God, the dwelling place of Adam, surely it is a blessed and holy place. There, Adam, our prince, will give an accounting to Christ, our king. So I think it's pretty significant that this great sacramental meeting will occur in a place where you and I can actually go and visit anytime we want. My, I don't know if my mind is expansive enough to comprehend the vast congregation that will be uh, within the uh, sort of the, you know, the, not the walls, but you know, the, the, that setting of the valley between the hills there at Adam on Diamond. That's what I envision. How about yes. you? I, I, I do as well. And I, I know that at times people have thought only the very spiritually elite, uh, the Michaels and the Peter, James, and John, and the Joseph and Jacob and, and Isaac and Abraham. And yet in verse 14, he definitely says, and also with all those whom, the, whom my father hath given me out of the world which I believe that, uh, that each Latter-day Saint that's faithful or would perhaps, fall into that category. I, I believe that that's true yeah, as well. Or perhaps you can even say it is taken out of the world or those who are not of the world. And then you go back into, into John in 15 and 16 and 17 of some very nice things of how one comes out of the world to be claimed by well, the Savior. Well, again, verse 14 harks back to the Savior's great high priestly prayer that's right. before the, the Garden of Gethsemane, in which he, he thanks the Father for the opportunity to tutor those that the Father has given him. And these, of course, are the apostles. But also, if you read carefully in chapter 17 of, of John, the Gospel of John, you also come to appreciate that that's also saying what verse 14 says, that's is right. that all of those who are faithful and true and who follow the teachings of the apostles, they're also included in, in this category of the righteous or those that have been given to the Savior or who have been pulled or culled out of the world. In fact, I think Elder McConkie said uh, not only the saints then alive, but all saints of that's past right. ages that's, that's will, be, exactly uh, right. will be present. So kind of a mortal and post-mortal gathering, I would say. Well, can, yeah. can you? Um, I, that's why I say I don't know if my mind is expansive enough to comprehend. You have, you have uh, prophets who have passed on, who have lived thousands of years ago. You have prophets of our dispensation. Uh, you have the Savior, you have the Ancient of Days, the very father of the whole human family. We're all sitting down and having this sacramental service. Incomprehensible, or I shouldn't say incomprehensible, an incredible experience. Well, da wonderful. Daniel says 10,000 times 10,000. Yeah. So yeah. That's, that's, that's quite a amazing. Few Talk to us about, uh, about verse 6. One of those that will participate in this sacramental service is named Elias. Um, well, here we get a, a doctrine of Elias coming out. Elias means one who restores, one who prepares. And then he mentions that this Elias is the one who appeared to Zacharias. And uh, we know that was Gabriel. And Charles Smith said Gabriel was Noah. So uh, here's just a little uh, tidbit of the doctrine of Elias coming out as... as uh, so, so this Elias spoken of in verses 6 and 7 is none other than the great prophet, Noah. Father Noah. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Uh, I'd just like to make one more comment please. here, Andy, and that's it. I, I suspect that many of us that have read and studied the scriptures have tried to envision what these great prophets and leaders would look like. I would guess at that uh, great meeting at Adam and Diamon, as we see them in the flesh, that uh, we'll see that uh, this meeting would supersede a trip to Hawaii or any other thing, that, <laughs> that a family vacation that might be on the block, where these become real, tangible individuals to us, yeah. not just people that we've read about and yeah. glamorized in the, in the scriptures. Yeah. We may think of them as a sort of surreal or not real, but there will come a day for sure when we will see that all of these prophets and apostles, patriarchs and leaders of the Lord's kingdom on the earth are real and that the resurrection 
is, is a true principle that the Savior hasn't been, the prophets haven't been kidding us that this is all an actual fact. Don't you suppose in this, in this setting, it's, it's fun to think about this, but don't you suppose that there's a training going on here in the, in the participation of our present sacrament, once again, in verse two, the focusing, yeah. that if one were present at that future sacramental meeting, that one wouldn't be necessarily stargazing of, oh, look, here, here's, but once again, those who would be there are focusing on the Savior Jesus Christ again at that wonderful meeting, because read those names is Joseph, yeah. Jacob, Isaac, they were focused individuals on the Savior. And so once again, it's that almost that training of what we're doing in our sacrament. That is the purpose of our meetings is to partake of sacrament and to be focused. Well, I, and I'm getting excited. I better calm down. I'll have a heart <laughs> attack here. But for me, this great sacrament service of the future models for us the principle that the sacrament is the ordinance of unity with the there Savior. You there you go. And, and, and we will see later on in sections of the Doctrine and Covenants how important the principle of unity is to the Savior. He said to his ancient apostles, be one, because if you're not one, you're not mine. Well, we better practice being one because that's the principle that we'll find in operation in this great sacramental a millennial sacrament meeting. And when you say about unity, it's interesting when you segue over to, to starting in verse 15 is some people look at it, why, why in the world do you have armor of God in here in a sacramental section? But look at the unity that comes with the sacrament as serving as part of that armor of God, of the way that it protects us in, in all of the areas that are mentioned throughout there. It's, it's the unifier becoming one in the concept of living the gospel as well as being protected by those principles. It's really great. Yeah, it, the, the, the Lord knows how to craft a revelation. That's, <laughs> what, that's what we're saying here. You know, I think he's saying something else in addition to this, and that is that preparatory to this great meeting, Satan, the arch deceiver, is going to do everything he can to destroy uh, the, the opportunity of people to be there. And the only way that we're going to be able to withstand in that evil day is if we will take that armor of God and use it to protect the different parts of our, of our being against those adversarial In, in fact, attacks. verses 15 through 18 of section 27 really hark back to a, another section of uh, a, a prophetic literature in the letters of Paul. This, six. Yeah, this is, a, this is founded on, a, on Ephesians 6. Uh, and talk to us. For, well, in fact, uh, let's get Brother Bott to read for us verses 15 through 18, because I do think what you, the point you made is an important one. Wherefore, lift up your hearts and rejoice, and gird up your loins, and take upon you my whole armor, that ye may be able to withstand the evil day, having done all, that ye may be able to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, which I have sent mine angels to commit unto you, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of my spirit, which I will pour out upon you and my word, which I will reveal unto you and be agreed as touching all things whatsoever ye ask of me and be faithful until I come, and ye shall be caught up, that where I am, ye shall be also. Amen. Thank you. But well, as, as much as I'd like to spend more time on section 27, <laughs> we better move to section 28. Uh, uh, section 28, give us just in 20 seconds historical background on, on section 28. Where, where are we and what's happening? Uh, if you don't mind, Andy, uh, this is uh, where uh, Hiram Page has a seer stone kind of interesting, mm -hmm. and uh, claims to receive revelation for the church. Uh, we have this, uh, it's a pre-conference uh, problem. They're going to have a conference in September, and, and uh, we've got to handle this. I think Joel's is sitting there, we've got to handle this before the conference, but uh, I believe it was pretty much resolved, and Hiram uh, basically backed down and, and uh, resolved that. But the problem was, <laughs> Uh, we had several of the Whitmers and Oliver Cowdery who believed in Hiram's uh, mm. revelation. You know, um, Alex, you said something I thought was really important is the notion that this isn't the problem with revelation. And it wasn't the problem of Hiram receiving revelations. And you emphasize that very well. It was revelation for the church. You know, and that, that seems right. to raise the hackle. So the problem is not revelation in and of itself. It's this order of revelation okay, for. That's exactly the point. And so articulate for us the principle that we can derive from section 20 of the Doctrine and Covenants. 
Well, maybe the articulation comes from the Lord himself in verse 2. Read it. But behold, verily, verily, I say unto thee, no one shall be appointed to receive commandments and revelations in this church excepting my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., for he receiveth them even as Moses. And then there's a call for obedience in verse 6. And thou shalt not command him who is at thy head and at the head of the church. In interesting order there. Only the prophet declares doctrine for the church. Only the prophet receives revelation for the church. Uh, kind of jumping ahead and correlating this with section 132 verse 7, there's never but one person on the earth at a time who is authorized to exercise all priesthood keys and to declare doctrine and to unfold the mysteries for the entire church. And that person is the prophet, seer, and revelator, the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Look how patient he is in being able to do this. We go back to section 21 uh, when you look at that, is the establishment of the prophet and saying, let us remind you who this is. Then we see a reminder coming up here, and we're going to see it again when we get into yeah, current one. That's yeah. right, and yeah. it says, the Lord is patient, saying, let me rem remind you of something I've told you before. Very simple, but very profound principles that are applicable today. Yeah. But there's another point I think that we should not have missed, and that is that there's another source of revelation other than from God. Yeah, that's clear from this section. And and very that's, much that's so that source that, is. that Satan it deceiveth him. You go tell uh, Hiram Page that the revelation he got was a real revelation, but it was from the wrong direction. It was not from my source. Yeah. Joseph, Joseph said there are revelations from God, revelations from man, and revelations yeah. from Satan. Yeah. And that's, uh, it's and clear that's, it's, that's where it's part from. of mortality, isn't it? Learning to discern where the source of revelation lays. True. Uh, we need to get it from the right source. One last uh, comment, I guess. I'm particularly taken with verses 12 and 13. Uh, which teach us two principles. Verse 12, I think, teaching us the principle that revelation does not go contrary to church covenants. And that 13, the law of common consent keeps the church ordered properly, and that's the way the Lord does His business. Well, thank you very much for a very lively and en enlightening discussion. Appreciate you, brother. Thank Thanks. you. Visit our website to find out more about the Doctrine and Covenants. Go to byubroadcasting.org. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University.